The title of my presentation is Advocacy for the Ever More Effective Control of Physical Pain. I hope that I will be able to convince you of the importance of this topic, even if, due to the limited time, I will mention only a few relevant publications. In 1914, George Washington Cryo, a surgeon from Ohio and one of the founders of the Cleveland Clinic, published a small book in which, among other things, he clearly defined the three major principles of pain medicine. His discovery and teachings were and are not accepted by the medical establishment, and now, a hundred years later, pain education, not only in the United States but around the world, is dismal, and as a consequence, state-of-the-art pain therapy is seldom applied to the patients, and pain research is grossly underfunded. The first major principle of pain medicine described as Dr. Cryo is that pain can kill. Untreated or undertreated severe pain can cause severe serious deleterious effect up to the demise of the patient. In his publication of 1914, Dr. Cryo included this simple chart. It shows that in 1908, mortality rate associated with the surgery performed in his hospital was 4.4%. In the following four years, the only things that Dr. Cryo did was to aggressively improve post-operative pain. As a consequence, in 1912, the mortality rate had decreased to 1.9%, an improvement that continued the following year. In 1985, at the University of Washington, a service totally dedicated to the treatment of acute pain was first developed. Its implementation and spread has been responsible not only for the decrease of suffering, but also for the decrease of uh, the duration of hospitalizations. For instance, after lung surgery, hospitalization decreased from an average of 16 days to 5 days. A seminal study published in 1987 found that in high-risk elderly surgical patients, optimal post-operative pain control greatly decreased post-operative complications. These are a few details of the study. The average age of the patients was 72. All had serious systemic diseases and all had to undergo a major surgical procedure. They were assigned either to a group to receive the standard post-operative pain therapy provided in that hospital or to the other group which received optimal post-operative pain control. This slide shows some of the relevant statistics. Mortality rate was 0% in the optimal pain control group versus 16%. Other complications, including respiratory and cardiovascular failures, were also significantly lowered in the group with good pain control compared to the other group. From 1980 to 1994, John Libeskin at the University of California at Los Angeles demonstrated in a series of basic science studies that uh, in laboratory animals both untreated severe chronic and acute pain cause a significant decrease of the immune system. In these animals, the injections of a certain type and a certain numbers of cancer cells cause the development of cancer. This did not occur in the control animals, which had not been exposed to pain. If this occurs also in human, and this is a big if, then should effective pain control be an integral part of a comprehensive cancer therapy. The second major principle proposed by Dr. Cryo is that pain, especially chronic pain, can be caused by changes in the nervous system. 
Therefore, it is a neurologic disease. The third major principle is that pain therapy has to be individualized. Dr. Kryl, a keen observer of his patients, wrote morphine should not be given in one dose but in repeated doses until the physiologic effect is produced. In other words, pain therapy must be tailored to each individual patient's need. This simple study published by Datsun in 1982 should be known by every healthcare professional treating patients in pain. This study involved 49 women undergoing a hysterectomy. It was performed by the same surgeons using the same surgical technique. This was done to minimize the variable. The women were then allowed to use as much parenteral morphine as needed to control their postoperative pain. The results showed that two women required 1.2 milligrams of morphine every four hours, and one woman on the other extreme required 34.8 milligrams of morphine every four hours. That is about a 30 times difference between the lowest and the highest. It is clear that if every patient would have been prescribed the same amount of morphine, the great majority of patients would have either been undertreated or overtreated. In order to understand the present status of pain medicines, we need to briefly review its history. As mentioned earlier, Dr. Cryo's discoveries were not accepted by the medical profession, and the pivotal role that severe pain has in the development of often fatal diseases such as pneumonia, myocardial infarction, major infections, and even severe depression went unrecognized. John Bonica in 1944 started to study and treat pain patients and introduced the multidisciplinary approach to pain therapy. In 1953, he published the first comprehensive uh, textbook on pain therapy. In 1967, Dr. Cecil Sanders opened the St. Christopher Hospice in London, starting the hospice movement, which promotes the relief of physical pain as one of its fundamental tasks. In 1973, Dr. Balfour Mount in Montreal started the palliative care movement. In the 60s and 70s, there was a surge of interest in pain medicine. Melzack and Wall published the gate control theory. The endogenous opioids, the encephalins and the endorphins, were discovered, and the pharmacology of opioids was studied in great details. The International Association for the Study of Pain was founded, and the journal Pain was published. In the 80s, guidelines for the effective treatment of acute and cancer pain were developed. The hospice and palliative care movements started to spread in the industrialized countries of the world. It also became clear that for severe, excruciating, high-impact pain, the type of pain so intense to make the patients uh, mostly bedbound, the judicious use of opioids often in combinations with other form of uh, analgesic therapy, was the only treatment able to provide the needed relief. However, the derivatives of opium are associated with bothersome side effect and, if used carelessly, they can be deadly. They are far from being the ideal drug, but presently they are the most effective medications to treat severe or high-impact pain. Unfortunately, even today, these effective therapies are very rarely applied worldwide for at least two major reasons. The first is the lack of education in pain medicine and the proper use of opioids. 
The second is the lack of availability worldwide of legitimate opioids. With regard to pain education, in 1990, Ron Melzack, in the Scientific American article entitled The Tragedy of Needless Pain, denounced the lack of education of physician in pain therapy as the uh, fundamental cause of unrelieved pain. Indeed, 28 years later, lack of education in pain and its therapy continues to plague the medical profession. A Canadian study published in 2009 shows that uh, during the four years of professional education, veterinary students receive an average of 87 hours of pain education, nurses 31, and medical students 16. The problem of lack of education prompted the ethicist Ben Rich to say, the knowledge deficits of physicians concerning the assessment and management of pain have been documented in the clinical literature since at least the early 1970s, yet persistent calls in that literature for reform in the health profession's curricula have been ignored with impunity. 80% of the world population has no access to opioids, and almost 5% has very limited access. Furthermore, in the United States, Many insurance companies refuse to pay for multidisciplinary therapy, and in the last eight years, there is a fierce campaign to limit the legitimate use of opioids. The 90s were years of chaos and contradiction. Society learned that pain could be controlled, and that severe pain is often associated with severe depression. However, the great majority of physicians uh, is unable to treat them. In the United States and in other industrialized countries, patients unable to get relief started to ask for physician-assisted suicide. This happened more and more frequently, so much so that in uh, 1995, then Pope John Paul II, in the Encyclica Evangelium Vitae, condemned euthanasia but supported palliative care. Equally, in 1997, the United States Supreme Court ruled that euthanasia was not a constitutional right, but effective palliative care is. In the United States, during the first decade of the new millennium, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention noted a proportional gradual increase of death associated with prescription opioids. The opioids were more frequently being prescribed to treat pain that, up to that point, had been untreated or undertreated because of limited pain assessment. The significant problem was that this increase in prescription opioids was not associated with an increase in education, in pain therapy, and the safe use of opioids. Despite the plea of pain specialists for a balanced approach to the crisis, including considering the risk and benefits of opioids for the treatment of severe pain, and focusing on developing technologies and methods to prevent diversion, the underlying cause of the crisis. The Center for Disease Control started a fierce campaign to delegitimize the legitimate use of opioids, using misleading non-scientific data and uh, questionable tactics. This recent article by Mark Rolls highlights the tactics of the Center for Disease Control to convince politicians and the media to criminalize the legitimate use of opioids. This includes the use of misleading partial statistics. For example, the often quoted statistic that over 99% of hydrocodone used in the world is used in the United States is true. But what is uh, not divulged is that hydrocodone 
is not used in any other country than in United States. Also revealed is the use of other subversive tactic. For instance, the selections of only individual who agree with their agenda to be member of uh, panels entrusted to write their guidelines. The Center for Disease Control approach had a very serious chilling effect on physicians. They either stop to treat patients with chronic pain or decrease their opioid dose to ineffective amounts. Severe, unrelenting pain is not different than physical torture. Should we then be surprised if these patients in search for some relief turn to the street to buy illegal drugs with all the risks associated with them? In 2011, at the beginning of the campaign to limit the legitimate prescription of opioids, there were a total of about 16,500 opioids overdose deaths. In 2017, that number has increased to 49,000 deaths. To this number of deaths, we have to add many more unaccounted deaths, which are the results of collateral damage in the form of infection caused by contaminated needles, infection like HIV, AIDS, hepatitis C, as well as infection from other organs. There has also been an increase in suicide, which leads to the destructions of families, as well as an increase in the number of orphaned children. Could uh, this tragic result have been prevented by a different approach. In 2001, Portugal was in the midst of a drug addiction crisis. The government elected to use a medical approach to treat the individual with addiction. In the United States, instead, addiction is criminalized and the majority of patients are incarcerated. In 2016, in Portugal, for every one million populations, six people died of drug overdose. In the United States, 185. Dr. Eduardo Bruera, one of the organizers of this conference, has just published an article denouncing the frequent lack of availability of injectable opioids necessary for the treatment of uh, some patients with advanced cancer. He also reports another study which shows the increased concerns of oncologists in prescribing opioids. In 2010, the cancer patients referred to palliative care were receiving and median dose of 78 milligrams of morphine equivalent every day. In 2015, the daily dose had decreased to 40 milligrams. In summary, the point I want to make is that medicine and society had failed to recognize that intense pain can be the primary cause of serious physical and mental diseases. As a consequence, scores of people suffering severe pain die every year worldwide from pneumonia, myocardial infarction, major infections, and suicides. These people could be saved by the effective control of their severe pain. This speculation is supported by the fact that 80% of the world population has no access to legal opioids. The failure to treat severe pain when possible must not be an option as it can be interpreted as homicide by omission. 
Another clear sign of the unrecognized serious pathological effect of pain is the unexplained major differences in the doses of opioids used to treat two equally serious diseases, the disease of pain and the disease of addiction. The Center for Disease Control uh, published some pain guidelines that like to limit the opioids dose to treat most types and intensity of pain to 50 milligrams of morphine equivalent per day. Addiction, instead, is treated with a range of about 300 to 1,000 milligrams of morphine equivalent per day. The serious pathological effects of severe pain is not a new concept. As I have pointed out at the beginning of this presentation, 100 years ago they were reported by Dr. Cryo. Forty years later, Dr. Bonica described them in greater details. And this is what John Libeskin said 25 years ago about his basic pain research. Pain is simply another stressor. We have no reason to believe otherwise. It happens to be a very, very uh, uh, effective stressor from the standpoint of immune suppression and tumor enhancement. There's nothing so fascinating then about this finding from the standpoint of a new observation. I think it's more interesting from the standpoint of politics than I do from the standpoint of science, and I would say that to anyone. We believe then that when more evidence of this sort becomes available, that uh, we can hope that we'll be able to convince health professionals everywhere that pain is not merely an unpleasant uh, something, an, an unpleasant event, that's something that to be born with stoic grace and a brave smile, but that it can be a significant pathogen, as John Benica has told us last night, that it can be itself an aggressive disease that can have an impact on morbidity, even on mortality. In short, the pain can kill. Thank you very much. At this point, however, you may ask, what is the relationship between pain with spirituality, the topic of this conference? I have chosen the testimonials provided by two people of faith to answer these questions. The first is an anecdote. A nun dying of metastatic breast cancer was transferred to an hospice. A few days later, she thanked the hospice staff and said, now that my pain is tolerable, I'm able to pray again, something that I've done all my life. In 1987, then Pope John Paul II, during a private audience to a international group of pain specialists gave a letter to John Bonica. In the letter, the Pope reflects on the mystery of suffering and the parable of the Good Samaritan. But I was very surprised to read the following. The work that you are accomplishing is immensely important for the good of humanity. As you seek the ever more effective control of physical pain and the oppressions of the mind and spirit that physical pain often brings with it. I was surprised because this is a concept that many healthcare professionals fail to realize. I like to end my presentations with a short video clip of the private audience. There is enormous pain and suffering in the world. Ah, yes. ah, Tremendous. Ah, and ah, we work very hard to make people aware that pain and suffering is a problem in its own right. And Dr. Banika has played a tremendous role in the world to tell this to people. It is, uh, it is uh, your mission, maybe yes. that, your, your vocation, your vocation, your youth. And so I am deeply convinced uh, since so many years, for, as a young priest, I work with also the, the physicians, with the doctors, yes. and that you, you have a special participation in the mission of our...